5.7 million year old human footprints. That's the story. Um, <clears throat> I see I'm, I missed taking out one thing. Um, I'm going to give you a story in Science Daily that's called Fossil Footprints Challenge Established Theories of Human Evolution. It's dated August 31, 2017, so it's fairly up to date. Sources Uppsala University, and for what it's worth, the photo that's in the background that I'll show you a little bit more is taken from YouTube, uh, but it's all over the internet. Um, and uh, let's see, ah. for some reason they, it doesn't show. Well, let me uh, back up to the beginning and you can see the there's the, the photo. Uh, we'll see it more at the end. Um, and uh, the uh, summary of the article is newly discovered human-like footprints from Crete may put the established narrative of early human evolution to the test. The footprints are approximately 5.7 million years old and were made at a time when Previous research puts our ancestors in Africa with ape-like feet. Um, this is interesting because uh, some of you may know that the Laetoli footprints, which are three point uh, something million years old, uh, uh, are basically human. The uh, the footprint looks human. We'll look at some ape and human footprints in a little while. We, we had a talk about this once. And uh, uh, the ape foot kind of vaguely resembles the human hand with a short first digit that tends to go out so that they can grab things with their feet. Uh, whereas our feet are strictly made for walking. Uh, the footprints were discovered by Gerard Gerlinski, the first author of the study, by chance when he was on holiday in Crete in 2002. Uh, Gerlinski, a paleontologist at the Polish Geological Institute, specialized in footprints identified the uh, footprints as mammal, but did not interpret them further at the time. Actually, he had a pretty good idea what they were, but he didn't want to say until he'd come back with somebody else, because this is the kind of thing that could get you shot down easily if you didn't have all your ducks in a row, so to speak. Um, in 2010, he returned to the site together with, uh, I won't even try that, the second author, a Polish paleontologist now at Uppsala University to study the footprints in detail. Together, see, he thought they were human, but he wasn't sure because how can these be human? And so he went and got somebody else and said, well, yeah, they have to be human. Together they came to the conclusion that the footprints were made by hominins. And um, the photo, by the way, is uh, by Andres uh, Bo uh, what is it, Bocharowski or something like that. Oh, here's the photo. And you can see it pretty well. Now we're going to look at it in more detail than that. And remember, these are professional trackway look, uh, uh, observers. Ever since the discovery of fossils of Australopithecus in South and East Africa during the middle years of the 20th century, the origin of the human lineage has been thought to lie in Africa. More recent fossil discoveries in the same region, including the iconic 3.7 million year old Laetoli footprints from Tanzania, which showed human-like feet and upright lo locomotion, have cemented the idea that hominins, early members of the human lineage, not only originated in Africa, but remained isolated there for several million years 
before dispersing to Europe and Asia. That is a story that you'll read in National Geographic if you go back a few months. This, the discovery of approximately 5.7 million year old human-like footprints from Crete. They're fudging, but they're more human than anything else, and you'll see. Um, published online this week by an international team of researchers, overthrows this simple picture suggests a more complex reality. Human feet have a very distinctive shape, different from all other land animals. The combination of a long sole, five short forward pointing toes without claws, and a hallux or big toe that is larger than the other toes is unique. The feet of our closest relatives, the great apes, look more like a human hand with a thumb-like hallux that sticks out to the side. We're going to see some pictures of that later on. The Laetoli footprints thought to have been made by Australopithecus. Why? Because humans weren't around at that time. Are quite similar to those of modern humans, except that the heel is narrower and the sole lacks, lacks a proper arch. By contrast, how many people do you know with flat feet? Um, by contrast, the 4.4 million year old Artipithecus ramidus from Ethiopia, the oldest hominin known from reasonably complete fossils, has an ape-like foot. Um, and it looks like Australopithecus does too, but, uh, but it had to be Australopithecus, had to have a human-like footprint because we have the Laetoli footprints and it had to be Australopithecus. The researchers who described Artipithecus argue that it is a direct ancestor of later hominins, implying that a human-like foot had not yet evolved at that time. Well, maybe not in Africa, but... The new footprints from Trichalus in western Crete have an unmistakably human-like form. This is especially true of the toes. The big toe is similar to our own in shape, size, and position. It is also associated with a distinct ball on the sole, which is never present in apes. The sole of the foot is proportionately shorter than the Laetoli prints, but it has the same general form. In short, the shape of Trachylus prints indicates unambiguously that they belong to an early hominin, somewhat more primitive than the Laetoli track maker. They were why more primitive, I'm not quite sure, but they were made on a sandy seashore, possibly a small river delta where the Laetoli tracks were made in volcanic ash. What makes this controversial is the age and location of the print, says Professor Per Alberg at Uppsala University, the last author of the study. At approximately 5.7 million years, they are younger than the oldest known fossil hominin. Sehelanthropus from Chad, and contemporary with Orion, pardon me, Ororin from Kenya, but more than a million years older than Ardipithecus rambidus, with its ape-like feet. This conflicts with the hypothesis that Ardipithecus is a direct ancestor of later hominins. You see, because you had humans before that, then Ardipithecus is just a side branch or a mixture or something. Furthermore, until this year, all fossil hominins older than 1.8 million years, the age of early homo fossils from Georgia, came from Africa, leading most researchers to conclude that this was where the group evolved. However, the Trachylos footprints are securely dated using a combination of foraminifera, marine microfossils from over and underlying beds, plus the fact that they lie just below a very distinctive sedimentary rock formed when the Mediterranean Sea briefly dried out 5.6 million years ago. So, you know, maybe they've got it wrong, it's 5.6 instead of 5.7 or 5.8, but it's not 5.5, at least if you believe radiometric dating. By curious coincidence, earlier this year, another group of researchers reinterpreted the fragmentary 7.2 million year old primate Gre Grecopithecus from Greek, Greece and Bulgaria as a hominin. 
Gregopithecus is only known from teeth and jaws. During the time when the Trachylus footprints were made, a period known as the Late Miocene, the Sahara Desert did not exist. Savannah-like environments extended from North Africa up around the Eastern Mediterranean. Furthermore, Crete had not yet detached from the Greek mainland. It was still connected. It is thus not difficult to see how early hominins could have ranged across Southeast Europe as well as Africa and left their footprints on a Mediterranean shore that would one day form part of the island of Crete. This discovery challenges the established narrative of early human evolution head on and is likely to generate a lot of debate. I thought you couldn't do that. Whether the human origins research community will accept fossil footprints as conclusive evidence of the presence of hominins in the Miocene of Crete remains to be seen, says Pearl, Pearl Alberg. Well, but don't you kind of have to follow the evidence? Now I'm going to give you uh, another, a couple of paragraphs from another website. This one is Real Clear Science. For those unable to see beyond Africa as the human cradle, these tracks present a considerable challenge. Uh, and it has not been easy to get the discovery published. Ooh. Uh, there's no bias in science, though, is there? Um, some have even questioned whether the observed features are footprints at all. However, collectively, the, the researchers behind this study have published over 400 papers on tracks. So we are pretty confident we know what they are. Sorry, that's their misspelling. And then a uh, paragraph down. It is now for the researchers in the field to embark on finding more tracks, or better still, body fossils, that will help us to better understand this interesting period of primate diversity which ultimately led to our own evolution, irrespective of where this first happened. The very essence of this type of science is prospection, discovery, evidence-based inference, and debate. We are sure that this paper will stimulate debate. Let us hope that it also stimulates further discoveries. So, now, there's another paper that is fascinating, but I'm not going to get into it. I'm just going to draw your attention to it, um, which covers the background behind this and notes that there have been something like five different other discoveries that completely um, upset the apple cart in 2017. So what you were taught as secure science isn't. But um, what is the paper behind all of this noise? It's uh, possible, possible hominin footprints from the late Miocene, circa 5.7 million years of Crete, question mark. Actually, it's pretty obvious. The problem is they know that there are sailing into the teeth of the wind. Um, this one is available online. It is new enough that they don't actually have a page number. This is the closest I can get you to the, the, the reference. Um, so, and I don't know, for those of you who are into this, uh, I'm going to just uh, draw, there's, there's the first and second author that you'll notice. Uh, Martin Lockley is one of the authors. Matthew Bennett is another. And we're going to see those names pop up in other uh, venues. The abstract goes, we describe the late Miocene tetrapod footprints tracks. Tetrapod? Well, that's being... Um, generous uh, from the Trachylus locality in western Crete, 
degrees, which show hominin-like characteristics. They occur in an emergent horizon within an otherwise marginal marine succession of Mycenaean age, latest Miocene, dated to approximately 5.7 million years just prior to the Mycenaean salinity crisis. The tracks indicate that the track maker lacked claws and was bipedal, plantigrade, pentadactyl, and strongly entaxonic. It means it had a big toe that was stuck next to the other toes. And you'll see why that's important in a little bit. The impression of the large and non-divergent first digit has a narrow neck and bulbous asymmetrical distal pad. The lateral digit impressions become progressively smaller so that the digital region as a whole is strongly asymmetrical as opposed to what bears or cats or dogs might leave. A large rounded ball impression is associated with the hallux, the ball of the foot. Morphometric analysis shows the footprints to have outlines that are distinct from modern non-hominin primates and resemble those of hominins. The interpretation of these footprints is potentially controversial. I guess you could say that. The print morphology suggests that the track maker was a basal member of the clade hominini, but as Crete is some distance outside the known geographical range of pre-Pleistocene hominins, we must also entertain the possibility that they represent a hitherto unknown late Miocene primate that convergently evolved human-like foot anatomy. So it's either a hominin or it's convergent evolution. You can take your pick. Introduction. Fossil tracks provide information about the presence of a track maker at a moment in space and time. Inferring a track maker from a trackway is only possible when there is sufficient and distinct morphological data to make the link between trace and culprit. A track is produced by the interplay between the shape and anatomy of the foot and the pattern of loading, mediated through a compliant substrate that is sufficiently elastic to deform yet rigid enough to retain the impression. You don't make trackways on stone, and you don't make trackways on water. The variables are pl at play here are complex, and a single track maker may produce a range of tracks. E.g., Brand, 1996. In case anybody is curious, that happens to be Leonard Brand. Um, Bennett et al. 2014, Milner and Lockley 2016. Notice Lockley is one of our authors. So yeah, you can get different tracks from, different, from the same animal on different substrates. In many cases, detailed knowledge of a track maker's pedal anatomy may, may be unknown. By the way, we should just write this all off because it cites a creationist reference. Um, it is therefore not surprising that ichnologists practice parataxonomy in classifying traces. Only where there is sufficient data to infer a track maker do they make a formal link to conventional, a more formal link to conventional paleontological taxonomy. Before I flip this slide out, um, Warren, you might be interested to notice. Just. Interesting. Where such linkages are made, they can have controversial implications, especially where body fossils are absent from comparable locations and stratigraphic intervals. And you may recognize this guy. You may recognize, uh, let's see, we're not, from, uh, we're not to the, the one that where we have a whole bunch of. Here report an example of the challenges of making such inferences when the implications run counter to conventional views on human evolution. Hominin-like footprints from the late Miocene of Crete, at least 5.6 million years old and thus approximately 2 million years older than the hominin trackways from Laetoli in, Tanza in Tanzania. The oldest and uh, by far the oldest hominid footprints 
Um, and here is a map of Crete is that island right there. Uh, Graecopithecus is found in Europe, in Greece, uh, and uh, Bulgaria, I believe it is. Uh, Sahel Anthropus is in the middle of Africa. Orion, or, pardon me, Or Orin is down in Af Africa further. Laetoli Traxite, Ardipithecus, uh, Kadaba is there. Okay. And um, there's um, uh, the island of Crete, and you can see that up on this end there's a peninsula out here, and that's the Trachylus tra track site, which uh, they have uh, mapped out to uh, various things. This is alluvium, and, and you can see the, the various, uh, this is upper Miocene, and the trackway is in the upper Miocene. And uh, they've carefully mapped out the geology. And here's the transgression surface, and they're actually in the Vresis group, Mycenaean. There's the footprint, there's the Vresis group, and there's the Hellenicon group, which is up here. So they've got the geology all nicely lined out. They have to do this because you know what's going to happen. People are going to say, oh, that's only one million years old. And here's one uh, for Art Chadwick. What do you see there? Ripple marks. And um, I think they said that the, rip, the, the, the flow is estimated to go in the north-northeastern direction. You may want to put that in your data bank. Um, but uh, the other thing that I want to point out is look at the size of the footprints here, and then look at the size of the ripple marks. Those are some major ripple marks. An interesting question as to how you get those. Where I remember seeing giant ripple marks before was in the uh, uh, Missoula flood, or the Washington State flood, or whatever you want to call it, where you have ripple marks that uh, uh, are even larger than these, but implying massive flow. And that raises a very interesting question. Apparently there's a flow, it disappears, and then people walk across it is what it looks like. Um, uh, oh, it's going to, yeah. This is, uh, this is interesting. You see this, I think this is the level layer they're talking about. And part of profile with thick, unsorted, conglomeratic horizon, probably res representing a Tsunamite. Thought you'd be interested in seeing that just along the way. So apparently in this area there have been uh, what's interpreted as tsunamis laying down massive pieces of rock. Unfortunately I don't have a scale for that. Although you do, do get kind of the feel that it's a pretty, pretty large uh, section there. Digital morphometric measurements were performed using Digitrace and landmarks exported for analysis. And there's a bunch more stuff that's more or less in that same kind of detail. The comparative populations consisted of, these are, these are what they're going to compare them with. And we're going to see photos of it in a bit. Um, 3D scans, 31 3D scans of habitually unshod tracks made by members of the Dasanach people from Illaret in Kenya. Now, for what it's worth, um, uh, when people wear shoes, their feet tend to be a little differently shaped than when they go barefoot all the time. And so 
if you're going to compare this with human tracks, you want to compare this with human tracks from people who don't wear shoes all the time. Um, and then they have four 3D scans from baboons, uh, 11 3D tracks from G1 trails of Laetoli, taken from first generation cast, held at the National Museum of Kenya. Can't actually look at the tracks themselves. And due to the lack of 3D primate data, 15 mixed species 2D primate images, baboons, gorilla, green monkeys, and chimpanzees were also included. So they looked at various non-human primates. Then they did foraminifera samples, were taken from fresh exposures and surfaces above, below, track bearing surfaces. In total, 11 samples were analyzed for their macropaleontology. Why are they going into all this detail? Because they know they're going to get challenges. It can't possibly be that old. Geologic setting and age. The coastal rocks at Trakalas west of Kissimmee Harbor in western Crete lie within the Platanus Basin and present a succession of shallow marine late Miocene carbonates and siliclastics of the Rocco Formation, a local development of the Vrissus group. At the top of this marine succession, uh, pardon me, at the top this marine succession terminates abruptly in the coarse-grained terrigenous sedimentary rocks of the Hellenicon group, which formed by the desiccation of the Mediterranean basin during the Mycenaean salinity crisis an event dated to approximately 5.6 million years. And if you don't believe them, you can look it up. Um, the succession, figure 1D, contains an emergent horizon with well-preserved terrest uh, terrestrial trace fossils and microbial-induced sedimentary structures, immediately overlying shallow water ripple mark structures. Well, uh, also fast water from the sound of it. Eleven foraminiferan samples were taken at intervals through approximately 20 meters of succession spanning the tracked horizon and terminating just below the Hellenicon group conglomerates. All these samples yield uh, two different foraminifera, constraining the samples to a time interval between 8.5 million years and 3.5 million years. So even if you didn't believe that uh, desiccation event, you're still stuck with 3.5 million years, which is earlier than the Laetoli trackway, I think. Uh, it's or, or at least about the same time. We conclude that the succession of at Trachylus can be securely assigned to the Miocene and dated to the time interval 8.5 to 5.6 million years based on, one, the end time Miocene uh, Hellenicon group is the only terrigenous incursion into the marine succession of Western Crete during this time interval. Wait a minute. You mean Crete, not just Crete was land at this time, but Crete had been underwater before and after. Interesting. Um, how did that happen? The foraminifera samples lack post-Miocene index taxa, huh? and the Zanclean of Crete is represented by deep water marlstones, not shallow water carbonates. Crete was under deep water at this time. How do you do that? Anyway, skipping over a paragraph, the emergent horizon forms an exposed surface about 21 meters in, de in length and 6 meters in maximal width and can also be out identified in sections in neighboring outcrops. The immediately underlying strata contain moderately large ripples with microbial mat-related structures, wrinkles, on their crest, suggesting deposition in extremely shallow water. In between surfaces B1 and B2 are 42 oval sediment-filled impressions on surface A, all of approximately similar size and shape, with long axes oriented south-southwest to north-northeast. They're going the same direction. 
The north northeast end of many impressions is associated with a small field of ripple crests oriented perpendicular to the south southwest north northeast long axis and suggesting north northeast flow. The general configuration of the regional landscape was the same as in the Mycenaean was the same in the Mycenaean as now, with land to the south and sea to the north. A north-northeast flow direction coupled with complete absence of marine macrofossils in surface A therefore suggests that this water flow could represent a temporary freshwater flooding event, perhaps a small stream bursting its banks. That's a big ripples for a small stream, but um, whatever. The uh, ignofossils on surface B2 the tracks themselves number more than 50 in total on an area of less than 4 meters. Their size ranges from less than 50 to more than 200 millimeters in length, but this includes a distinct subset of small and irregular features of uncertain origin. Those ones they don't want to say they're tracks because they're not sure. Although <coughs> the ignites that can be most readily identified as footprints range in size from 94 to 223 meters. Uh, millimeters, so apparently there's quite a big difference in the size of the of the feet. Although individual trackways are difficult to discern on the densely trampled surface, the majority of footprints show a northeast southwest long axis orientation. Two identifiable tracksways conform to this pattern and show that the track makers were traveling from the pardon me toward the present day southwest. So they're heading into the current, or at least where the current was, which is an interesting way to head. Both trackways are narrow and appear to have been formed by a bipedal track maker due to the absence of four-limb tracks. We're going to see four-limb tracks in the case of the gorilla. An apparent pair of left and right footprints may have been made by a stationary individual but we cannot exclude the possibility that this is a chance association. And we're going to see that too. Here's some of the figures and here's some of the trackways. Here you can see one trackway that's going up this way and another trackway that's going this way and they're going to enlarge those for you. And uh, you know you could make a human foot out of that, couldn't you? Um, here's the stationary one possibly representing that, although it's interesting because this foot seems to be smaller than that foot. Although if you were heading into a water flow, would you see that? Here's a, an example of the foot and you notice that you have a large toe and then sm progressively smaller toes. Um, this is an actual photo of it. This is a laser scan, which I presume that basically is kind of the same thing as a scanning electron microscope, except that you're using light scattering instead of, uh, instead of uh, 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 electron scattering. And um, and this is their interpretation where there's some of this has infilling sediment that hasn't been cleaned out I guess um, uh, or, and some of it has overlying sediment that also hasn't been cleaned out and this of course is just flat out erosion from something else um, and you can see where the sediment has kind of been pushed up around the outside, the uh, purple. Um, here's another one, again with the interpretation. You can see that there's quite a decent sized ball of the foot. Um, the laser is a little bit easier to see than the uh, plain photograph. Um, and yeah, although I wonder if two and three have kind of fused together there. Maybe that's a deformed foot. Here's one that looks, you know, pretty, pretty close. And you have a ball of the foot. You have the first, second, third, fourth, fifth toes. 
and heal. And this one is actually pretty close to standard human now. Here's some uh, pho uh, photographs of, of uh, here's a bear. And yes, there are five toes, but you'll notice that the big toe really isn't that much bigger than the rest of them. Uh, here is a um, monkey, a gorilla. Notice that they, there's, the big toe is way out to the side, just like the monkey. And, he, and these are the prints of the knuckles. He's knuckle walking. There aren't any knuckle walkers in, in this setting. And here's a chimpanzee. And again, you have the um, stuff out here, and then you have this. Of interest, it looks like the footprint of Australopithecus was actually in the same way that as the big toe was stuck out to the side. You can see how this is almost like having a hand. And of course, humans are not anywhere near like that. This is a standard human footprint, just walking. Here is so one of those footprints that you saw earlier. And here is a another ancient trackway that's generally conceded to be human. Comparative analysis. The track list, uh, tracks appear to have been made by a bipedal track maker with plantigrade and taxonic. That means the big toe is next to the other ones. Plantigrade means you're walking flat on the, on the plantar surface and not sidewalking as is typical for uh, uh, many apes because they like their feet to be able to come together and grab trees and stuff like that. Um, Five-toed feet that did not leave claw impressions. Back, let's go back and look at that bear and you'll notice that you can see the toes and then you can see the claws sticking out. Um, the first digit of the foot was bulbous, whereas digits two th through five were slender with no significant gap between the hallux and digit two. A well-developed ball was present. The main alternatives that need to be considered given the Neogene Old World context of the tracks are monkeys, apes, and bears. Skipping on, the tracheolus tracks are bipedal and thus appear to discount both carnivores and non-hominin primates due to their habitual quadrupedalism. That is, chimpanzees knuckle walk. Gorillas knuckle walk. The endemic Miocene hominoid Oreopithecus from the Valesian to early Tyrolean of the Tuscany Sardinia archipelago, which has sometimes been interpreted as bipedal, is a relatively near neighbor of the trackless tracks in time and space and should thus be evaluated as a potential track maker. However, because it has an extremely divergent hallux that could not be fully adducted, it is unlikely that Oreopithecus could have produced footprints like those of tra uh, Trachylus. It looked very much like a gorilla. It does, that's just not a gorilla print. The trackless tracks represent hominin prints um, and you'll notice uh, Bennett, 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 and Lockley. That's some of the authors of this paper. Due to their plantigrade and entanxonic nature. By contrast, the morphology of the sole print is not especially hominin-like. Compared to a modern human sole print, it is proportionately shorter with a narrow tapering heel and lacks a permanent arch. Although... There are people with flat feet, too. Interpretation and implications. The characteristics of the trackless footprints that need to be explained are bipedality and plantigrade posture, pentadactyly, five toes, with entaxony, the t big toe plastered up next to the rest of them, and an absence of claws, 
the distally attached and non-divergent bulbous first digit and short lateral toes in the presence of a distinct ball of the foot in some of the tracks. The morphometric analysis suggests a closer affinity to hominin tract outlines than those of extant non-hominin primates. This leaves us with two possible interpretations. One, the tracheolus tracts may have been made by a phylogenetically basal member of the clade hominini. This interpretation explains the combination of unique hominin characteristics in the anterior part of the foot. So this is a hominin. Now, what does that mean? The age of the tracheolus footprints, though strikingly early, is not problematic for this hypothesis. Well, they don't say. Assuming an age of slightly more than 5.6 million years, they are approximately coeval with Orion and somewhat younger than Sahelanthropus. So it certainly could be, but if that's the case, Ardipithecus is not a human ancestor, period. With dates of 7.175 million years for the Greek mandible and 7.24 million years for the isolated Bulgarian tooth, Gregopithecus is probably rather older than the track of footprints. It is obviously highly relevant to the interpretation of the prints. But the fragmentary nature of the specimens and the absence of postcranial material limit the conclusions that can be drawn from it at present. They have a tooth and a jaw, and they don't have anything else on Gregopithecus. But Gregopithecus is probably not a Pithecus, it's probably an Anthropos, a human. Alternatively, we could look toward a hitherto unrecognized primate, potentially unrelated to hominini, but possessing overall morphological similarities with this tribe. The hominin-like characteristics, particularly the anterior placement of the first digit, would re reflect an example of convergent evolution, a, a familiar phenomenon in the fossil record. Notice Lockley et al. are again cited. Um, <clears throat> The large size genus Uranopithecus, present in Greece and adjacent regions during the late Miocene, has been proposed as a close relative of the hominini or hom hominidae, hominins, chimpanzees, and gorillas, though this is debated. However, its pedal morphology and locomotory behavior are unknown, as most of the available fossils pertain to craniodental material so they don't have feet. The first of these interpretations is clearly more straightforward. There is nothing about the character, complement, or morphometrics of the tracheolus prints that positively suggest convergence with hominin morphology, and as noted above, there is no positive body fossil evidence for the existence of such a convergently hominin-like primate. In a formal sense, interpretation two thus fails the Occam's razor's test of explanatory parsimony. However, we feel that it should nevertheless be entertained because nature is not always parsimonious. And more importantly, interpretation one carries major biogeographical bio implications that also need to be examined critically. What are you going to do with humans in Europe before we'd have documented humans in Africa. Skipping on, conclusion. We have presented two alternative interpretations of the ignites found at Tracolos. The hypothesis that the Tracolos track master was a basal hominin carries substantial implications for early hominin biogeog biogeography as well as for the development of bipedality and the intaxonic foot with the big toe plastered up to the other ones. Given the challenging nature of this potential interpretation, it might be prudent to, cons to delay, consider prudent to delay taxonomic assignment. We don't know what to call this thing um, because we're not sure whether it's human or not. However, despite the fact that the full 3D anatomy of these tracks is not optimally preserved, they are not poor trace fossils. Their outlines are particularly clear and form the basis of the morphometric analysis presented here. Better and more numerous trace fossils are always to be desired. We'd like more of these things. But 
Equally, one cannot ignore the currently available evidence and their potential implications, however challenging they may be. Whew. Further prospecting for ichnofossils and body fossils in the late Miocene of the Eastern Mediterranean area has potential to resolve the identity of the Trachylus tra track maker and should be an urgent priority. Now, the footprints appear to be compatible with human prints. They also appear to be securely dated. But don't forget what happened to the bird-like dinosaur tracks when the creatures turned out to fly. Maybe um, if, if, if you need a refresher, uh, Google that, that Precambrian rabbit. Um, there's a whole video on that. Uh, uh, basically, they were securely dated using trace fossil and using argon-argon dating. And then they turned out to be birds. And all of a sudden, they um, um, they couldn't possibly be, be Triassic bird print tracks. And so they went back and redid them by lead-lead dating. And sure enough, they got a later date. So maybe we're going to find out that that transgression actually wasn't 5.6 million years old. It must have been later. They don't fit the usual story. The footprints certainly don't. If the advocates of evolution have their way, the story will sometime, someday be told, presenting the evidence but never mentioning the controversy or how things had to be rearranged. Because you see, what we need to do is spoon feed people stuff that won't arouse their curiosity as to how we're sure that these things are what they say they are. But that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. Oh, okay. Um, well, at the end, yeah. Okay. Comments, questions? Well, they, they look like ridges. I presume that's just the sediment that didn't come out of the tracks, trackways? I, I, that's what I think. They're, that's how they're interpreting it, it looks like. That commonly happens. Yeah. Well, uh, you can imagine. And do you remove that stuff? Because once you remove it, you can't put it back. And if you were removing track instead of, you know. Well, I don't know what that sediment's like, but in the Coconino that happens and you can't take it out. It's just stuck there. Probably gets cemented in is my guess. I see a nice tridactyl dinosaur track right there at the bottom in the middle. Uh, well, <laughs> if you use your imagination, I guess. I think this is a sobering moment for physical anthropology. Uh, and uh, probably it's a cause them to think a little deeper about their ideas. Uh, it's commonly stated you can't get two physical anthropologists to agree on where to eat lunch together. Because uh, it's a field that's been just uh, loaded with disagreement. <clears throat> you have uh, too many ideas running after too few facts. And uh, I think this is another example of it. Well, I think that one of the things is that this particular set of facts is rather difficult to st uh, fit into the standard arrangement. Uh, and it's particularly difficult to st fit into an evolutionary, well, first you have the chimpanzee or something like it, and then you have the, um, 
Australopithecus, and then you have the uh, Rhamidus, and then the Australopithecus afarensis, and then you have the Homo uh, habilis, and then the Homo erectus, and then the uh, the crowning uh, uh, of of them all, Homo sapiens sapiens. This has been going on over a century. I mean, it's just, uh, there's probably no area of science that's more uh, conflicted than physical anthropology. Paul, did you have a picture of the barefoot walkers in there somewhere? I didn't see what their foot looked like. Was that uh, that? that modern human track uh, you, you know in the article they didn't have it and I didn't uh, no. go over to research it um, sometimes we should the other thing that would be interesting would be to uh, because there's a vast different uh, a number of human footprints themselves there's long skinny ones there's short fat ones and I think one would be an and I've seen lots of people with their big toes turned in, and the ball of the foot is actually medial to the to the big toe by quite a margin. Um, and then usually they say that's because you're wearing too tight shoes, but um, if you had rheumatoid arthritis, it would deviate that way anyway without having to have uh, too tight shoes. It would be very interesting to, to have a podiatrist lecture on human footprints and the variety that you could get just to compare with this kind of thing and to compare with the Laetoli footprints. Uh, my brother has flat feet. I think it kept him out of the army. Um, uh, don't ask me why that supposed to be important because he, you know, went into medical school, practiced medicine, and retired, and uh, seems to be, you know, uh, have been able to walk any time he wanted to, but, uh, you know, flat feet do make a difference in how your impression is. Uh, so, you know, I've I could not say for sure that those were not human footprints. Uh, I can say for sure they're not chimpanzee footprints, because that toe sticks out. I mean, you, you saw the tracks. Uh, come in here and then come in here. Might it be possible to do some sort of um, CT scanning and look at the density underneath that sediment so that you might be able to see structures that you can't really remove? Well, in order to do that, you would have to take out a piece of the rock and put it somewhere. That uh, it, it's certainly possible. It would be interesting to uh, section one of those things and see whether the <laughs> But I don't think anybody's really questioning whether those are, are, are carved or not. They look very much like footprints made in wet sand, maybe underwater. Yeah, um, is that sand or mud? Uh, well, we have the material, so we should be able to tell exactly how, uh, what the consistency of that thing could have been. So when you lift your foot, it creates a vacuum and sucks the sand up underneath your foot. Yeah. That's true. How would you, as a creationist, explain these footprints? Well, that's an interesting question. I'd like an answer. <laughs> um, you know, um, well, one of the things that I find fascinating is that this is just below the only terrestrial uh, that is from, from Earth, uh, from dry land, um, as opposed to from the sea, uh, deposits there according to what they're saying. And that means that Crete was underwater most of the time and probably underwater during some of this time too. So what humans are doing or humanoids or whatever you want to call
call those things, um, running around going what looks like against the current if, if I'm reading how that's going. The current's going northwest, they're, they're running southeast or walking southeast. Uh, it's, that's kind of a fascinating what humans are doing there in the first place. Presumably this is late stages of the flood or early post-flood. Are all Miocene deposits of exactly the same age? I don't know. Uh, but they're, they're basically going against the current, if, they, if I'm reading that correctly. Or, or that uh, water flow after the water process that was placed in water flow? Well, I, I think that the, the ripples are made either simultaneously or probably before they, they ran across. So maybe there is a water wash coming over and then they ran uphill. And how many thousand years ago did this happen? Well, if, I mean, if you're a straightforward creationist, it would be towards the end of the flood, whenever that was. Um, if you're asking me, probably about 4,300 years ago, 4,400, but there are people who would put it 4,500 to 600, and there are people who put it 5,500, and there are people who would put it, uh, I, very few people put it over 10,000 years. I can give you a little, a little personal episode here. <coughs> um, Martin Lockley, when I was publishing papers on the Coconino Sandstone and footprints being underwater, he was always a reviewer and I had to deal with him and he didn't, he didn't like my idea at all that these were underwater. And he, he cites you. I know, but he, <laughs> this paper that there was cited there, it didn't deal with the Coconino and it really, he had no good reason to not like it. But he was, it had a little implication there, some things were made underwater, and he was a reviewer, and he blasted the paper and told them not to publish it, which they didn't. But then I so sent it to a different journal, and I don't know if those editors knew what had been going on, but I've never had a paper reviewed and accepted so quickly as that one. <laughs> but he, like you say, he, he, I don't know if he had anything to say about it, but he was an editor here and an author and, and That's did decide it. Fascinating. Uh, Apparently, he's come around to see that your paper was worthwhile. Or maybe they didn't ask him. <laughs> That's a possibility, too. He could have been one of the tail end authors that, that got to comment on a few things, but uh, they put some other things in. I, it, it would be interesting to see the internal politics of that particular paper's construction. It um, be interesting to look at all of the reports of human tracks in the fossil record. There's quite a number of them in creationist literature. And there's sandal footprints in trilobite beds. And a lot of those things have been discounted. I don't think there's any way that anyone could discount what we see here on the screen. Um, um, obviously, they tried. Oh yeah, they're going to try. Um, give you one example of tracks that are fake tracks. There was a William Taylor, British uh, scriptural geologist, and I just wrote a paper on scriptural geology, a second one. I had one published in Origins, another one in Answers Research a Journal last December. and. Um, in the frontispiece of his book, he shows Paleozoic human tracks. And there are two of them, and they're side by side, as if the man is standing. And there, the toes are long. The big toe is twice as big as the other toes. Each track has five toes. The heels are unusually narrow. Um, they're poorly uh, designed tracks. and most likely carved because they're in what's called Devonian rock. Somewhere in the Midwest, I think it was Missouri, and you know, Missouri is the show me state and <laughs> probably <laughs> someone tried to show people <laughs> what can be done with the imagination. 
But he published a whole book featuring that and other unusual things. That's 1855. Unfortunately, that was about the end of the scriptural geology movement because people just l made a laughing stock out of scriptural geology. And there are a couple works published after that in the late 1850s. So in my article, I point out that um, young earth creationists, scriptural geologists, strayed further and further from solid science, and they got more and more in, into speculation. Another example is this um, book, The Omphalos, which was uh, asking the question, did Adam have a belly button or a navel? <laughs> Omphalos is the Greek word for navel. And he wrote a whole book on this. And a well, serious it, scientist. It's, it's an important question. Uh, the trees that, uh, that Adam saw in the garden, did they have rings? Did in? they have rings? He would say yes. He would also say, were there um, beaches along the seashore that Adam and Eve walked on the first day of their creation? Were there uh, bird nests that were empty, you know, right from creation? He went on and on with uh, wild speculation. And that kind of thing really hurt creationists. Now, about 100 years later, we've been hurt with Clifford Burdick and his tracks, and we have an expert right here on the tracks, and we could spend a lot of time on that. But when you compare that with what you have here, world of difference, world of difference. I'm a, I'm a brand new person in here. How big are those? Can you show me this way? with your hand because um, I'm well, not. They're, be, they're between 93 and 220 millimeters. So that's uh, 10 to 20 centimeters. So let's say 15 centimeters is about, uh, let's see, 10 centimeters is four inches. So t 15 centimeters would be about six inches. So, uh, 20 centimeters would be eight inches. So they're 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 relatively small. Could it be a child or a or juvenile? or a small person? Uh huh. And do any of them look, appear as if they're they're in the middle of running, or is it all walking? I don't know that you can make that distinction, mm -hmm. but it looks uh, it looks to me anyway as a non-professional track uh, analyst that they're probably walking. Uh, running, there tends to be more of a distance between tracks, and they tend to pound down heavier when they do land. Unless you're a child. Unless you're, well, eh. Um, actually, what you'd have to do is you'd have to, you'd have to have some children running across sand and then go back and measure the stuff. And that, you know, that's really the way to do it. Um, speculation as to what should happen kind of gives way to actually doing the experiments, as uh, one Leonard Brand has shown the rest of the world. Uh, and I think that uh, you can't really answer those questions until you've, until you've actually watched the tracks being made and then go back and look at them. I'd like to just comment briefly on whether this creature, this human, was walking or running. I'm a runner. I've been a long-term runner all my life. Somewhere I read in a running magazine is that when you run, the force on your foot is two and a half times as when you walk. So there are a lot of physics studies and and formulas on that. So two and a half times would really leave a, a much deeper imprint. So I would say they're walking. That's, that's an untrained observation. That and, and the stride for running is usually longer. Exactly. Uh, I'm, I'm actually a, uh, have been a long time ago, a, a uh, race walker. 
And there are actually rules for walking and how you know it's not running. And one of them is you must have at least one foot on the ground at all times. If, you're, if you have both feet off the ground, it's called floating and you're not walking anymore. And you do that twice, you get once in the race, you get warned, and then twice in the race and you lose. You, you're disqualified, just for what it's worth. So, so your stride is only so big, and then after that, you wind up leaping, and that's what running is, is actually leaping from foot to foot. So I think with running, you're going to be pushing off with, with your, your toes, basically. And so there's right. probably going to be a lot more, the length of your toes is going to be longer. There's, and it'll probably deform the, the front part of the foot. Yeah, uh, you'll run off the toes in the ball. Yeah. And, and that, you get your power off of that. Um, Ariel, you had something to say. Do we have anybody else here that we're missing consistently? Uh, um, Doug, can you pass the... The time. Hardly worth mentioning, but I, <clears throat> I do feel that uh, this study is, to me, fairly good study as far as they could go within the constraints of uh, what we might call methodological naturalism. Uh, they, were, they didn't overstate their case especially they seem to be cautious about it I appreciated that and they uh, emphasized uh, ecology you know is a it's kind of a wild science in a ways uh, both taxonomically and uh, empirically it uh, I mean you have to try and sit there and figure out what's going on with so little data you have to go on that uh, uh, it could stand some caution, and I think they express a satisfying degree of caution here. I think there's another thing too, and that is that actually technology has been going on for centuries. You you read about guides in the woods that that oh, and there's a bear, and there's a deer, and you know, and then uh, there's a human, and they track them, mm -hmm. and there's Bigfoot too. Uh, yeah, <laughs> and and they track them and and uh, you know can follow an animal, and um, in uh, societies before you had refrigerators, there was a payoff at the end. You followed the bear or deer far enough, and if you had a gun or a bow and arrow or something like that, you could bring the creature down and then eat from it. Uh, so there was a. There was an incentive to uh, be a good ichnologist. Well, I, I just share an anecdote. The, uh, the pro proclivity that humans have to make foot tracks knows no bounds. Uh, a couple that I know were canoeing in Lake Powell and they went up a side canyon, and I guess they needed to use the facilities <laughs> that weren't there. Anyway, they, they left the uh, canoes and they went hiking up this side canyon. And up this side canyon, they found two perfect human tracks that were four feet long, carved in the rock. <laughs> <laughs> I have pictures of them, I know what they look like. They're perfect. All the toes are there. Foot track is it's very well planned out. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, there's actually v YouTube videos of, of tracks like that. Yeah. Uh, um, there's a good heel in the shoe. I've seen the picture of it in the Cambrian. That's just clear down the bottom of the Gerard Collin post. Uh, that leads to Phanerozoic. Yeah, it's, a sh it's shaped like a heel and, and, and a sole or a shoe. Looks like it. It's just a coincidence. <laughs> Do you think this will be ignored? Or do you think this will stir things up? Uh, will it be ignored? Uh, well, I'm sure some people would like to. Um, I think that they've done their homework well enough that it's going to be difficult to ignore it. Uh, I anticipate people 
really trying to date these things to a younger date. That's been done before. Uh, the only question is um, whether that can be done in this particular setting or not. Um, and uh, there, there's two famous cases that it happened. Uh, one of them is the uh, Skull 1470, which is surprisingly human. Um, and uh, was dug up by Richard Leakey and then uh, the date for the ash was lowered by um, uh, about, if I remember correctly, about f uh, 20 percent or so, which made it fit much more comfortably into the standard uh, uh, the standard uh, scenario. So somebody might come and say, well, it's really not 5.7 million years, it's really 2.7 million years or 3.7 million years. And all of a sudden, okay, and that takes care of the problem. The, the problem is that they've got this uh, drying out event and that event is securely dated to 5.6 million years. And so you basically, you have a hard ceiling to that date or hard floor if you prefer. Um, you can't lower it any further than that. Has there ever been a major deviation in the age of the rocks? Has there ever been a Oh, well, do, do they ever do that? Well, like I say, there's been a couple of them. One of them is our Triassic bird prints, which were redated using argon argon. And, uh, uh, pardon me, it was dated originally using argon-argon, which is probably the best method if, if, as methods go, um, and then was redated using lead-lead, which has probably the worst assumptions of any method. Uh, um, but the lead-lead dating gave them the, 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 the date they wanted. It was also dated, by the way, using an index fossil which means that the index fossils aren't any good if they controvert the standard scenario. So, I mean, if you have Triassic birds, they just can't be there, and so you do what you have to, to to get the date you need, which is to put them into the Jurassic when birds actually existed. I, I was, I was this, in, oh, good. This phenomenon, by the way, is something interesting because it's common to see tracks before you see bodies. Uh, you see human tracks before human bodies. You see uh, tetrapod tracks before you see tetrapod bodies. Uh, amphibians. Uh, even, in the, even in the Cambrian, there are little uh, movements of stuff before you see the actual critters that that uh, that you know explode in the in the Cambrian explosion, mm -hmm. there's tracks there before before you see the uh, the bodies. The, there are lots of fish scales millions of years before you find any fish. So that it, you know apparently we have we have this kind of discontinuity. Uh, and, and it's common. And, it, you know, why people can't say, well, you know, they just, they made tracks and then we find the bodies later. Of course, then if you do that, then you kind of mess up your nice little neat scenario where you have evidence for everything. Why do they make tracks first and then the, and then the bodies show up? Well, maybe it's because they're running away from something and the waters are rising up. Oh, can't, can't go there. I can share another example of, of redating, which is um, very important to me because back in the 1980s, Tidwell, a uh, paleobotanist from U uh, Brigham Young, presented a paper at the, uh, at the um, palynology meetings in which he describes a a maple branch with wood, leaves, samara, and flowers 
all all the characteristics from a from a maple in the uh, Navajo in the Dakota sandstone, which was Jurassic at that time. So uh, that's some, well before the Cretaceous. Yeah. Of a flowering plant explosion. So I asked him some years later. I asked him what happened to that description. He said, "Well, they moved the Dakota sandstone up to Lower Cretaceous." Well, that doesn't really help because it's still Lower Cretaceous, but but <laughs> it seemed to resolve part of the problem. Oh, well, if you need it to be someplace, then you just figure out ways to make it happen. And I, I, I'm, I'm suspecting that there will be a lot of people trying to prove that this stuff is really three million years old. And then the story can be, well, they just migrated out of Africa a little earlier than we expected. Mm -hmm. Of course, it still leaves uh, Ardipithecus and, uh, and uh, uh, Australopithecus kind of uh, hanging high and dry there because there were humans at the same time. Interesting. Anyway, uh, two things. One of them is come back next week. We'll talk about water bears. And two, um,